Hello there, friends. Welcome back. I was rummaging around in a box the other day, and I came across something that not only had I forgotten about, but also that led me down uh, a bit of a rabbit hole of memories that culminated in wanting to put this video together for you guys. I'm trying to, uh, I am trying to overcome the cringe factor f for me that comes with some of this stuff, some of these memories, and I hope that won't be a factor for your enjoyment, because I assume that the cringe part of this only really, uh, affects me, <laughs> but um, I've got a few items here, a few little mementos from uh, a chapter from long ago. The, the, the main body of this video at the end is going to be a paper sounds video mostly as we look at the contents of this manila envelope here on the bottom but in order to understand what's in this envelope I have to uh, set a little bit of context with these other items Now, the, uh, the item that I found in that box that I was talking about is this cassette tape. And this cassette tape contains some music and some of my voice from a long ago, long forgotten uh, chapter of my youth from when I was in college. When I was in college, I was involved in the local student-run radio station. Um, I was involved in the station for pretty much the whole time I was at college during my freshman year. I was just a behind the scenes kind of a technical guy. I like the, I like the tech behind the scenes stuff, but the main thrust of the station was on air broadcasting. So beginning, I think in my second quarter of my sophomore year, I had a, uh, a radio show, and I kept that show for the rest of my time at college, uh, up through, up through November of 1989, and on November 7th, 1989, I had my last show. And this tape is a recording of about an hour and a half's worth of that show, recorded uh, using one of the cassette decks mounted in the uh, control room. And so it has some of the songs that I played on that last show, and of course because this comes with a territory, 
It uh, contains my voice as well. It's very strange, particularly now since I've been doing this ASMR channel for a while. It's very strange to hear what my voice sounded like 28 years ago. And uh, if I can if I can get past the cringe, maybe I will include a few seconds of my 28 year younger voice uh, for you guys to hear uh, at the end of this video. So, after I found this tape and I started thinking about those days uh, a lot more, I kind of rummaged around in some drawers and some file cabinets and I found a few other odds and ends from those days that I thought I might uh, share with you guys. Along with uh, some memories of what it was like back then to play tunes and sending them out live, you know, into the air. Uh, I've said before in in other forums that that this having a having an ASMR channel on YouTube reminds me a lot of those days because you're sending out content, you're you're never sure who or how many people are kind of receiving that content, and that was even more uh, that was even harder to know when you were on a broadcast station because unless people called you and talked to you during your um, during your show there's really no way to know right but the mystery of that was was really cool to me I remember thinking that was a neat aspect of my time at the station. So one thing we can discover right away uh, from this tape again falls into the cringe category for me but I will uh, share anyway was the, uh, the name of my show. I thought this was very clever at the time I, I am less I am less convinced of that now, but I was I was essentially a I guess a classic rock guy. If I had to pick one genre at that age, I guess I was most interested in classic rock type stuff, and so I liked playing songs from classic rock oriented bands that I liked, but I was fond of not playing the singles, but playing uh, deeper tracks, right? B-sides or, you know, things that never even came close to uh, becoming a single. So I was, I was ignoring the top 40. I'm trying to explain how I got to my cringy radio show title. Since I was not playing top 40... I was playing what was left. And once you take away the top 40, what are you left with? The low to mid 40s. I was borrowing a meteorological, you know, weather person term and using that to describe, describe, you know, what was left over after you stripped off the top 40 content of all the bands that I was playing. So that left me with the low to mid 40s show. That was the name of my... That was the name of my show. I don't know if I can focus on this little... Low to mid 40s show. 7 November 1989. Yeah, I know. I know. It's uh it's not good. 
But I have a few uh, pictures here of uh, some small glimpses of the facility. We had an actual silence on the air sign. This was out in the lobby of the uh, of the little station. And my recollection is that this light actually did uh, turn on when you flipped the switch to turn the mic on. So out in this lobby area was a, a bench and there were two kind of medium-sized uh, home stereo speakers that uh, people who were out in the lobby could use to hear what was going on, uh, what was going out over the air. Uh, this was a basement level uh, room, so these are um, ground level windows that went to the outside. This door led to a, a short hallway, and then you would turn left and go into the control room and you can't see it in the picture but right here on this wall would have been a large window that looked into the control room and then there was a little plaque on the wall here and these were probably names of uh, DJs of the year just silly little student uh, awards that they gave out at the end of every uh, academic year So that's our bona fide silence on the air sign. It's one of the things I had in mind when I uh, decided to call my occasional streams ASMR radio. Kind of tying it all together. Now this is a picture of me uh, in the control room. Uh, I can thank my uh, daughter for the awesome um, cartoon face that I'm wearing here. And here you can get a glimpse of what we had going on inside the studio. Here's the, uh, here's the large window out into the lobby that I talked about. Here's one of the two monitor speakers that we had in the room. A good old fashioned large format wall clock. I, I love clocks like this, by the way. We had a couple of logs up here on this little ledge. I think one of them was a, uh, a log where you would write down the songs you would play. And I think one of them was a public service announcement log, if I remember correctly. And then here right behind me, I'm, I'm kind of bummed that you can't see this any better, but here was the, the board, or the controls for you know, turning music up and down and turning your voice up and down. Let's see if I can get this a little. That was the mixing board slash control panel. Yeah, these large rotary uh, knobs with a three position kind of a toggle switch above each one of them. And, uh, you know, as you might think, you turn it to the, you turn it clockwise and things get louder. You turn it counterclockwise and things get quieter. And if you turn it all the way counterclockwise, there would be a little click. And when the rotary knob was clicked into its far leftmost position, it was in Q mode. And that meant if you played like an album to cue it up, when its channel was in cue mode, then you could hear the sound through the speakers in the control room, but it was not going out over the air. 
So you would queue it up in that mode, and then when it was all queued up, you would turn the knob up. We usually had, I think these are little pieces of tape, these two little white marks here. And you would uh, turn the knob up to a particular point, and then it was ready to play. And then you can just catch a glimpse of one of the turntables. These were, we had a pair of Techniques SL1200 Mark IIs. It's the same turntable in my uh, ASMR turntable video. This was the rightmost one, and there was one sitting to its left right here. I think there's a couple of CD players back here in this corner. And then we had a rack of gear standing tall here on the right side with some cassette decks and uh, signal conditioning equipment that were used to, you know, compress the signal before it got to the transmitter, that kind of thing. So that's me in the control room. Here's another picture of me. I really can't tell you what's going on with this shirt. But uh, here you get a glimpse of the rightmost uh, turntable. And I'm uh, getting the dust off of an album before I play it. And you can catch a glimpse of the uh, microphone hanging on a boom arm right over here. Here's the second uh, monitor speaker up here in the corner. This was shot from the doorway, so you can see, you know, the door frame kind of dominating the side of the picture there. Also me with my awesome cartoon face. My ear looks like a question mark. And I have a crown. So thanks to my daughter for that. So that's what the... Uh, inside of the college radio station looked like. And this this was my uh, FCC license. It had my name right there and it says I am authorized to operate any radio station which may be operated by a person holding this class of license. Not valid without FCC seal, and I think that's an actual stamped seal right there. The end of January 1987, which would have been my sophomore year. Yeah, it says a lot of things. The Paperwork Reduction Act. Well, there you go. So you could cut this uh, little license out and keep it in your wallet, I guess. As a licensed radio operator, it is illegal for you to do these things. It doesn't say that it's illegal for me to play bad music, so that's good. Nobody caught me. And it quite it quite surprised me at the time, but I actually received one of these DJ of the Year awards once. They would hold a little party at the end of every year and give three of these out, as I recall. This kind of thing always takes me by surprise because, you know, my, my normal mode of operation is fairly self-deprecating and uh, I'm usually convinced that uh, the things that I'm doing, regardless of the... Uh, of the topic 
are fairly well under people's radar. So anytime I get, uh, not, not that this has ever happened very often, of course, but whenever something like this does happen, it, uh, it's quite surprising. But I was very grateful for the, uh, for the, uh, the honor. Something about, um, you know, we had a, it was a very low power, uh, station. It was, uh, we broadcast at 160 watts, or as we like to call it, 160 million microwatts. We were always trying to make it sound a little more impressive than it actually was. So that probably only reached about a mile or a mile and a half uh, away from campus, um, depending on the weather slightly and some, some other factors. So when you were a DJ on this station, you always knew that the, the, the number of people hearing you were probably on the small side, right? Unless you uh, actually heard from someone, uh, it was very, very mysterious about who might actually be tuning in. It, it, it had a little bit of a feel to me like uh, throwing a, a bottle out into the sea with a message in it, right? You were never sure who, if anybody, was going to read that message or picking up on your signal. But like I said, I, I, I really enjoyed the mystery of that. And I, and I enjoyed thinking that if there were anyone listening, it was probably a very small number, like perhaps a handful of friends that might come over uh, so we can listen to music together. It, I, I liked thinking of it as a very small club when I was doing it. But we did hear from a few people. I did, anyway. I'm sure every DJ had s some of their regulars who would call in and make requests. And I had a couple of those. And one guy in particular, if you'll, if you'll indulge the story a little bit, and it, and it gets us to this envelope. One guy in particular, we'll call him uh, Mark. Um, he was a a night guard uh, at a local factory that wasn't too far away from the campus. And he was a big fan of the station. Not, not just my show, but everybody's shows. And his job um, put him in the position of, of being able to listen to a lot of the uh, a lot of the programs, a lot of the DJs. I assume that he had a, a little office or something like that, and then he would patrol the uh, the grounds, and then he would come back to the office. But while he was at the office, I I imagine that he had a little radio tuned to our station the whole time. And he actually uh, visited me once, um, probably sometime in my senior year. And uh, he was a very nice guy. But what was fascinating is that when he came out to visit, he brought a notebook with him that he showed me. And as it turned out, f over over the years that he would listen to the station, he would keep a notebook by the radio. And when things came on the station that he liked or that caught his interest or perhaps something that was new to him that he had not heard before, he would write it down in the notebook. 
And when he came out to visit me at the station one time during one of my shows, he brought this notebook with him. And it was amazing because it went back years. And it was this fascinating, organic snapshot of the station because it wasn't a it wasn't a complete log it wasn't like the log you know it wasn't like this log that would have every song we've ever played it was this interesting filtered kind of a log with notes and the margins and phone numbers for the the Larry King show that he would call in to sometimes and dates and times and maybe some DJ's names here and there and and tons of songs and the thing was just well it, for for a historically oriented guy like me it was just it was just an amazing thing to look through But then November of 89 came, and it was my last show. This would have been my coming up on my last quarter. I was looking for a job. It took me a while. It took me into the following year before I finally found my first post-college job and, and left town. But about a month after this show aired, about a month after the end of my tenure as a college DJ, this envelope showed up in the mail. The envelope was from this Mark fellow that I talked about. And you can imagine what it was. My, my radio show was on a Tuesday night from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Tuesday night. And what he did was photocopy from his notebook every page that included any entries made on a Tuesday from between the times when I started and I stopped my show over those three years. any page that had anything written down on a Tuesday, he photocopied those pages, stuck them in this envelope, and sent them to me. So you can see that it is a, or it was a simple spiral bound notebook. This was the top of the stack and this first page starts in September of 1986. This would have been the fall 
of my um, sophomore year, but we can see from my license that I didn't get my license until January of 87. So, but Mark didn't know that. So a month after I leave the air, this shows up in the mail. And I thought it might be fun, in the interest of doing a nice paper sounds trigger segment to this video, to look through these pages. We can muse a little bit about the things we find there. And I can uh, talk a little bit about some other memories that I had. But specifically, whenever we come to a Tuesday, I want to take a look at the songs that are there and see if I can figure out if any of them were mine. See if I can remember, see if it makes sense that, that some of the things I see would be uh, songs that I might have played on the show. Of course, you know, there's there's work in here from tons of other DJs on the station. And you gotta remember, you know, at this time this was a this was a real live over the air FM station. These were all college kids who were standing in the room talking into a mic live. And I I point that out because there's a lot of, you know, awesome podcasts and, you know, um, um, internet radio stations now where, you know, I'm sure their content is all wonderful, but a lot, but a lot of times what you're hearing is not live. There's, there's not someone making programming decisions and talking into a mic live as you're listening to it. But this was all good old-fashioned. You talk into the mic, and it goes right out over the air type stuff. So everything you see in this log are the results of kids like me playing their favorite music, you know? Inviting a few people into the living room that they were creating with their uh, music and having a small over-the-air listening party. That's what, that's what all this was about. Now, like I said, the first few of these pages won't have any of me on them because I didn't get started until early 87, but let's start looking at these. Still in September 86. There's the Beatles. Black Sabbath. Paranoid and War Pigs. October. There's the score of a... Uh, a basketball game that Mark must have been listening to. And here's the score of a, a football game between the Redskins and the Vikings with the note, Hard to Believe. So Mark was a uh, sports fan as well. And you're always free to pause the video if you really want to look in detail at some of these song lists. That's a Tuesday in November of 86. That Jeff Beck is something I might have played, but... Coming up on December, here's Tuesday in early December 86. 
Smoke on the Water from Deep Purple. I think everybody knows that tune. There's a Frank Zappa reference in that song. Now looky here. Here's Tuesday, February 17th, 1987. And there's a little note here that says, Eric, Eric's show. <laughs> and it says in, in quotation marks, mid to lower 40s show. Which, which I deserve, I think, because the, the name of the show was so cringy in the first place. So it, I completely forgive him for a, uh, kind of, you know, wording it wrong there. So some of these were probably from my, uh, one of my early shows. This says 740, which had been, would have been earlier than I started. But that's Spirit and UFO, Uriah Heap, I, I totally could have played those. April Wine. Sign of the Gypsy Queen was a single from them, but... They were a little bit of a, well, I don't want to say one-hit wonder, but I think they were underappreciated, so, yeah, that was, uh, it's probably me. Here's a Tuesday in March. These Rush ones could have been mine. Here Mark writes, Happy Birthday Mom on March 25th. Tuesday in May. That Steely Dan song could very well have been mine. Looks like the person after me this night was featuring uh, the new Fraley's Comet album. Ace Fraley was from Kiss, of course. He did some uh, solo albums as Fraley's Comet and looks like uh, the DJ after me at 11 was playing that in its entirety. Here's a Tuesday uh, in September. So here we are in the fall of the next school year. I don't think this... Johnny Otis song was mine, though. Tuesday, September 8th. I don't think this Frankie Valley song was mine either. I like these uh, Yes songs that some guy played on Wednesday, though. Those are nice. Like some old school punk stuff in here as well. Being on the radio was just a, it was a really surreal experience for me. You know, I grew up Oh, this section in here could have been me. Broadsword from Jethro Tull, Howlin' at the Moon, Magnum Opus from Kansas. That's very much my wheelhouse right there. I don't know, when you, when you grow up kind of thinking that you're mostly misunderstood, that the kind of things you like 
are not really the kinds of things that anybody around you likes, you know? And this was before the before the the web, of course. These days it's so easy to find communities of people that are into exactly what you are into, right? But back then it really wasn't the case. And I grew up thinking or feeling mostly misunderstood for most of the time. Of course, that's not really a me thing, is it? That's probably more of a being young thing, a wanting to assert your identity thing. I'm sure we've all gone through that. When I got to college and was able to do something like this, this was one of those things that is just was just so outside of my experience at the time. It seemed so unlikely that a guy, just a regular guy like me, could go and, you know, claim a couple of hours of FM airtime every week and play whatever I wanted. That just seemed so wonderfully alien to me. You know, when you when you feel kind of out of control and misunderstood a lot of the time, to, to be able to step up to the mic and say, this is me, and here are some things that I like, and I'm going to send them out and you can enjoy them or turn them off as you like. That's perfectly fine, but for these two hours, I'm calling the shots. And I didn't feel like I got to call the shots very often, you know? And so it, it was a very empowering little hobby. I really, uh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I probably played these. I'm very sure I played this Steve Morse band, Cruise Missile. That's a great song. The Amboy Dukes, that was a single they had. This was Ted Nugent's old band. The other thing about, um, the other thing about this Tuesday night show is that in the in the major that I was in in college particularly in your junior and senior years haircut and tires today that's good to know most of the classes that I took uh, during my uh, junior and senior years were four credit classes and at this school 
the four credit classes were almost always on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So that meant that if your whole schedule was nothing but these four credit classes, then you generally never had classes on Wednesday. So that means Wednesday felt like a weekend in the middle of the week. <laughs> Look at this song, Goodbye Norma Jean from Elton John. That's obviously a candle in the wind. But goodbye, Norma Jean are the first words in the first uh, verse. That's funny. So the quarter... I don't know, the, the weeks seem to go by a little bit differently when you had every Wednesday off. Because you'd go to school for two days, then you have a day off, and you'd go to school for two more days, then you had two days off, And you go to school for two more days. So it felt like there was always a day off or a weekend right around the corner. And of course, the, the day before your day off always feels like a Friday. So I would have Wednesdays with no classes. And then Tuesday night... I got to go to the radio station and play music for a couple of hours. And so it was just a fantastic vibe. It was, it felt so much like a Friday night weekend coming up. You know, I'm not worried about anything. I can deal with homework the next day. I got to go, you know, if I had some albums that the radio station didn't have, I might pick out a few there in my room before I left, and then I'd walk across campus with my arm full of albums, and I'd get there and start uh, start pulling vinyl out of the racks and putting a show together. It was just such a nice time. It's so interesting seeing these lists and knowing that, you know, everything Everything on these lists from all these days were choices that some college kid made. They're like fingerprints in a way. Hey look, Mark talked to Larry King at 1.35 a.m. on February 10th of 88. Good for him. Rush and Dire Straits down here. This is a Thursday night show from somebody. <laughs> Some old uh, Kiss songs.
I wonder what this means. He wrote an entry for Sunday and he's got question marks there. I like that Elton John song. Kinks on this Tuesday. I don't know if that was me. I guess it probably was. Hope you guys are hearing these paper sounds well. Here's a couple of Kate Bush songs, Wuthering Heights and then Wuthering Heights with new vocal. That sounds like something that I would do, compare a newer version to an older version. Straits, Queen, Eric Clapton, The Dregs, Blood Sucking Leeches from The Dregs. That's a f another fantastic song. Speeding Back to My Baby is from Ace Frehley's 1978 solo album. That's what that's from. Yeah, this was probably Sleeping on the Sidewalk. That's one of the songs Brian May sings in Queen. Yeah, I'm sure this is a, uh, these are all from me. That's pretty cool. Rainbow Stargazer. I'm sure I played that. Dweezil Zappa, that was probably me. Mark wrote down a lot of songs on March 30th of 88. Saw a huge glowing object drop out of the 5.40 a.m. morning sky. Dropped like a white light rock. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that Steely Dan was probably me. Oh, the hiring fair from Fairport Convention. What an amazing song that is. That was probably the probably the live version with Simon Nickel uh, singing lead. You should go check that song out if you uh, don't know it. Frank Zappa's version of Whip and Post. Another live Zappa thing on this Tuesday, that was probably me. Well, there's Locomotive Breath on this following Wednesday from Jethro Tull. And Frankenstein from Edgar Winter Group. That's a great instrumental. I think I played that in a band once. If, 
If Love Should Go by Streets. Anybody remember that band? Steve Walsh from Kansas was in that band. This was like their the only single they had from their first album. I think. Rush, Vital Signs. Planet P Project. I did have some Planet P Project, so this is probably me. The Boy Who Can't Talk. Very interesting concept album type work. Tony Carey was the guy's name. This Mark guy really seemed to like the Wednesday DJs a lot. He's got a lot of very long song lists from Wednesdays in here. This is one of the most interesting things in this in this packet that he sent me. And I don't know if you can you can really tell what's going on here, but there's a little note written next to this entry for Star Trekken by The Firm, and the note says, not Jimmy Page's The Firm, but I don't know if you can see this, but this note is in blue. It's not part of the photocopy, so he actually wrote on this after he made the copies for me and wrote this note in. And it seems kind of amazing, amazingly specific that he would care to make sure that I knew out of all of these pages that if I got to this entry and said, The Firm, Star Trek, and I want to go buy that song, that he wanted to make sure I knew that it was not the firm that Jimmy Page was in, but it was a different band. I appreciate his thoughtfulness, of course, but that seems really specific, like needle in a haystack level of specific that he would think it important to make that distinction in a, in a resource like this. That's pretty wild. Fog Hat. I probably played that on this Tuesday here. Torture Never Stops from Zappa. I played a lot of Zappa. Then looky here, here's another huge Wednesday list. Mark really liked that Wednesday music. Hey, here I am, Eric's Low to Mid 40 show. The James Gang. James Gang had some great arrangements for, like, a three-piece. The Vigil from Blue Oyster Cult. Imagine so many of these bands and songs seem like dinosaurs to most of the people who would be watching this uh, content now, I think. Oh well, it is what it is. 
here's a Tuesday show. It looks like I was featuring... These songs are from a Zappa album called Broadway the Hard Way. I must have been playing the, the whole side here. Going up the country from Canned Heat, from the Woodstock soundtrack. Meet on the Ledge from Fairport Convention. I definitely played that. Richard Thompson, he started out in Fairport Convention. I've got a lot of his solo work. Here we are in early 1989 when the Grammys uh, gave the Hard Rock and Metal Grammy to Jethro Tull for their Crest of a Knave album. I remember when that happened. A lot of people uh, were dissatisfied with that choice. There's more Steve Morse band with Cruise Missile. Hawkwind, Web Weaver. I'm sure that was me. Ooh, there's the Clairvoyant from Iron Maiden that somebody played on a Sunday, and that's very nice. I, I liked a lot of uh, different styles. Here's Adrian Ballou, the ideal woman. I was never a, I was never a sports guy or a, or even a, an amazing student, frankly. But, and I do think, looking back, that I didn't really take advantage of some of the opportunities that both the college and the town that I was in had to offer. But but I'm glad I did this. This was, this was something I'll always look back on fondly. Randy California, the prisoner, he was in spirit. Thela Hunjinjit from uh, King Crimson. Robert Fripp and all those guys. P. 
People Who Died, the Jim Carroll Band. And Third Power from Steve Morse Band. Hope you guys can see this okay. Script for a Jester's Tear from Marillion at 10.03. That technically was not my show anymore, but that's definitely something I would have played. I was a big Marillion fan back in the day. Firehouse from Kiss, the live version. Hmm. This was really something to, to get in the mail. It's a really... Uh, Well, frankly, it was like flipping through pages of, uh, well, the pages ended up being like a little time machine, you know, taking me back through my radio career, career. <laughs> it was a hobby. I was never, you know, I was never what you would call super good at this. I was just a guy talking about music, you know. I never had what you might call professional DJ technique. Peter Haycock, that was probably mine. Steve Hunter, also. Look, we're up to October of 1989. That means we're getting close to my final show. Space Shuttle Launches Galileo. Hey, this one was uh, Don't Pay the Ferryman by Chris DeBerg. It's, he did really keyboard-driven music, DeBerg did, but if you want to hear some amazing fretless bass being played, listen to his stuff. Love the fretless bass in those songs. Liar from Queen, that's a fantastic song. Don't Be Late from Saga. They were a Canadian band. Uh-oh, here we go. The next to the last sheet. And we have Tuesday, November 7th, 1989. Last low to mid 40 show. Thanks for a fine program, Eric. So that means... We look at the tape. We ought to see some uh, we 
can see some matches here. The tape doesn't have the full show, so. And Johnny Be Good by Frank Marino. I see that here. There's a much longer list of what I played here in Mark's log. Prophet Song from Queen. That's here. Got it. Egyptian Danza from Al Di Miola. That's right here. Western Flyer from Eric Johnson is there. There's me doing You're Not Alone again. From Saga, Blue World from the Moody Blues, Chloe from Elton John. I did a uh, I did a short block of songs uh, dedicated to certain people that had called in to the show a lot, and this was uh, Mark's block of songs. That's what these little arrows mean. Last Chance from Shooting Star is in there. Jim Carroll Band, Klaatu. Yep. <laughs> oh, there's a... Uh, oh, there's the end of it. Okay. Uh, Letter from the Shelter. Planet P Project, Jacqueline from Jethro Tull, and then Crying and Laughing from Chris DeBerg would have been the last show, or the last song I played on my regular show. And this note says, Request Line is Now Closed. <laughs> so that is the interesting artifact that I was sent after my college radio days. I hope we were able to get a lot of nice paper smoothing sounds out of the stack. I was probably on the air once more after, after that show. this this picture of the uh, of the lobby reminds me of the very final time it was probably uh, close to Christmas one thing about our school is that um, if you were a senior and it was your last quarter you didn't actually have to take any finals because they needed to process the grades uh, earlier than that, so that they could have uh, that they can make all the arrangements for the final graduation uh, ceremony. So they calculated grades earlier and used you know other coursework. You didn't actually have a final to take during finals week, which meant the last week of the quarter when all of the other classes were taking finals, the seniors were not. And I remember on my last quarter there, uh, we did a little stunt with all of the senior members of the, the, the radio station. See, normally uh, during a regular week, uh, we, did not, we did not broadcast 24 hours a day. Because, uh, you know, these are students and they need to sleep sometime. Well, some of them do. So we would broadcast, say, between maybe 6 in the morning to midnight or till 2 a.m. perhaps during the week. And then we would broadcast 24 hours on the weekend. 
So for the final week of the quarter, when everybody else was taking their finals, we thought it might be a fun little experiment to take all the seniors and get them to take slots to fill every day of those seven days with radio programming, going 24 hours a day for those seven weeks of for those seven days of finals week and we called it senior takeover week the seniors basically took over our 160 million microwatt airwaves for all seven days of uh, of finals week and that was really really cool and I'm sure I had at least a couple of slots during that week uh, so I would have been on the air then as well. And this picture, <laughs> I wish I had a picture of the other side of the the lobby, because this picture reminds me a little bit of that senior takeover week. One of the cool things that we had during this week was a a promotional relationship with a small little pizza place down the road from the school. And in exchange for constantly mentioning their pizza store on the air, they would bring pizzas down to the radio station every two hours or something like that so that the, uh, the DJs would always have stuff to eat. And they would bring pizzas and they would bring Jolt Cola. I don't know if Jolt is even around anymore, but it was this super highly caffeinated cola that we were using to, you know, stay awake at these ridiculous hours that we were doing these shows. And in this lobby, on this right-hand wall, there was a bench. It looked like looked a bit like a uh, a church pew and above the bench there was a ledge and, you know the the two the two monitor speakers in the lobby were sitting on the left and right edges of the ledge but the whole middle was empty and we started to get into the habit during this senior takeover week when we were done with the cans of Jolt Cola, we would start lining them up on the ledge. And when the line of cans extended all the way across the ledge from left to right, then we started stacking the next row on top, and so forth and so on. And so by the end of Senior Takeover Week, the entire wall was covered in Jolt Cola cans. I wish I had a picture of that wall of Jolt Cola cans because it summed up the, uh, the senior takeover week and in, in some respects it summed up the, the whole college radio experience perfectly, right? Just, just a bunch of young f people doing their thing, looking for identity one song at a time, one hour on air at a time. And now, somehow, 28 years later, I still seem to be doing that, don't I? Looking for identity, staking a claim to identity, one YouTube video at a time, one sound trigger at a time, one memory at a time. I guess we never stop that, do we? We never stop looking for 
those ways to let the world know who we are. I was doing it then and uh, I'm doing it now. I hope you guys have enjoyed this little uh, rabbit hole that I uh, inadvertently got pulled into when I found this tape. And again, uh, if I can get over the cringe uh, factor, keep watching because uh, I will uh, take a few seconds of my voice from this radio show and I'll put it in at the very end of this video okay so thanks so much for watching and I hope you too never stop trying to put your identity out there into the world because we are all different and The world needs more of our individual uniqueness, I think, especially these days. So take care of yourself and take care of everyone around you. Try to make your little corner of the world a little brighter every time, every day. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. One classic British band that I never have any problems with uh, playing is, of course, Queen. And I'll be having a prophet song from Queen from their Night at the Opera LP coming up in just a second. But first, another, another man that I never shy away from playing here on the Low to Mid 40 show, as, as we all know, is uh, Mr. Frank Zappa. And uh, no Low to Mid 40 retrospective would be proper without uh, playing a little bit of Frank. So from the You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore Volume 1 compact digital disc set, this is Frank Zappa with Zombie Wolf.